Good morning, real life. I have been waiting to say that for a long time. If you don't know who I am and you're like, who is this guy and why is he talking like this? My name is Marty Solomon. Uh, I used to live here for 10 years. Um, I'm the president of Impact Campus Ministries. I served on the, on the preaching team while I was here. I hope that in some weird, informal, long-distance way, I'm still on the teaching team on some level. Um, I know I get text messages from some of them often, so I figure that counts, right? Um, but uh, we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio back in June. Uh, things are going well. Thanks for asking. Um, well, you did ask, so I was, I'm just going to answer that. There we go. So we have got settled in. We're having a hard time meeting people because of life, things. It's, it's the same over there, all the masks and the social distancing, and makes it hard to meet people. Uh, it's weird. So that's what we're struggling with as a family. But that's my life update. How are you guys doing? Don't answer that. Um, answer that later when we get to talk. Uh, we are kicking off. Why am I always? I'm, I'm here to kick off another sermon series. That's like... This is the thing I get assigned to do. We're kicking off a new sermon series. So every year at Real Life, we always did a series that was on church culture, church vision. Every fall, we kind of kicked off that school calendar year with a who are we as a church? What has God called us to do? And who has God called us to be in the world? And so we're starting one of those series here called Culture Shock. And I remember when Josh called me, we talked about this series coming up. He said, you know, we have all these things we usually talk about. We'll go through church vision. We have those four purpose statements out on the, painted on the wall. He said, what if we went over like God's purpose statements? What if we went over like God's big ideas? Like, I feel like that'd be a good, that'd be a good idea. And I thought, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. So he said, well, well the, the list that I can think of is the Ten Commandments. So why don't we take some weeks and go through the Ten Commandments and, and I got to sign the first two. So are you guys ready to go? I think it's enough setup because I'm already concerned about time, and that clock just keeps on ticking, so here we go, okay? I want to read through them to begin with. Let's, I'm going to go to Exodus 20. We're going to read through the first two commandments, and I know you're thinking, ah, I, know about the, I know the first two commandments. Uh, well, well, we'll see. We'll see. Here we go. And God spoke all these words. Hang on to that. God spoke all these words. Great translation. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So one of the fun things about this um, passage of scripture is we're so familiar with it that we kind of like, oh yeah, the Ten Commandments, we kind of like start to turn off. Uh, I have a teacher that calls it the lullaby effect. Like you're just kind of like, oh yeah. And one of the things that struck me, I was long out of, like long beyond my Bible training. Like I had my the whole ministry degree, I was clergy, I had been trained how to teach the Bible. It was way late in my life before I realized that not everybody agreed on what the Ten Commandments even were, like the numbers that go next to them. Did you know this? Now some of you are probably like, yeah, I grew up Catholic, I know all about this. Because there's a Protestant rendering of the list, and there's a Catholic rendering of the list. Did you know this? Now you do, the more you know, okay? So, so the Protestants, well, you're probably, most of us in the room are probably more familiar with the Protestant numbering. The the Catholic list will take the first, what we would call the first two commandments, and they'll smush them together. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven images. And they make that one commandment. And at the end, they take coveting, and they break it apart into two coveting verses. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and then you shall not covet your neighbor's stuff. And they base that off of the Sermon on the Mount. There's actually some pretty decent reasoning for why they've done that. But it makes your list different. And actually, it really messes up the first four, first five, that whole thing. But nevertheless, those are the differences. Did you know that the Jews say we both have it incorrect? Now, if you're like, oh, Marty, stop with your Jewish stuff. Why does it matter what the Jews think? Because this was their list. (laughs) They had it for like 1,500 years before we did, all right? So maybe the way, if anybody knows how they're supposed to be numbered, (laughs) 
I'm just saying, maybe the Jewish perspective would be helpful, all right? So let me just, let, let me show you what we typically, here's what you're probably used to. You're used to this, all right? First, first two verses, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, we say that's intro. Typically, in the Protestant world, we're like, that's intro. That's set up. So here's first commandment to the Protestants. You shall have no other gods before me. First commandment. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. That's going to be your second commandment. Let me show you how the Jews number the Ten Commandments. Hold on to that. Here's, here's the intro for them, okay? And God spoke all these words. That's intro. God spoke all these words. Here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. No, excuse me, I just did it wrong. Oh, I just screwed it up. Come back at 11 for the, that done correctly. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, if you're sitting there going, Marty, that's not even a commandment. You can't pull a fast one by me. The Jews have always said, we never called them 10 commandments. The Hebrew says 10 words. Did you notice the intro? And God spoke all, to them all these words. You can also say sayings. God spoke to them these 10, there's the 10 sayings, the 10 words. They're never called 10 commandments in the actual biblical text. They're always the 10 sayings. Deca, some, sometimes we call this list the Decalogue. If you're in theological circles, if you go to Bible college and seminary, they call it the Decalogue. Deca, ten, logos, words. The ten words, the decalog, decalogos. Okay, these are ten sayings. And the first saying ends up being, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now here's your second, second commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. So that's your, they do the same thing with that commandment that the Catholics do in their list. They just don't split the 10 and they add one on the front, which maybe there will be some more fun conversation to be had later about that. Now, I wanna just lead for the rest of this time, I've done my teaching, I now wanna just kinda of lead a reflection. I wanna reflect on this for our message this morning. Uh, the, I wanna go through these two ideas. The first one, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now, again, you're like, okay, it wasn't a commandment that you explained that, that's fine. But Marty, it's really just a throwaway idea. It's really just a throwaway commandment, a throwaway word. Like, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Duh. I want to stop here because I think of all the 10 sayings, this is the one that almost all of us as Western American Christians struggle with the most of the whole list. Like, like, we follow the other Ten Commandments pretty well. The one we struggle with the most is this one. The, this idea that I am the Lord your God. Now, when you listen to a rabbi teach on this, the rabbi's gonna talk about this first saying is really about recognizing the place of the other person in the relationship, in this case, God. Like, recognizing God's place in the relationship. The first saying is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You cannot ignore me. You cannot deny that I'm here. We are in a relationship. The first saying that we have to go through is that I am with you in relationship. You can do nothing until we acknowledge that. And I think, as modern American Christians, we struggle with that more than anything. We use God like a sticker that we put on a water bottle, like a decal, like, like the thing, like the label that you can bring along with you. Like we don't actually, like just think about it. Like what is it that drives your existence? What is it that's on your mind? What is it that you wrestle with consistently, constantly, when you get up every day? It, it, is, it your, is it your plans for the day or for your life, your dreams, your goals? Is it is your bank account? Is it, the, is it your worry, your anxiety, your stress? Is it that stinking iPhone? It's constantly, like nobody went, ooh, but the, I'm, man, are we addicted to our stuff? And we just kind of like bring God along, don't we? So we can kind of like slap him like a sticker on the things that we want and our different agendas, political agendas and life agendas and work agendas and family agendas and we bring God along like a spice that we sprinkle on the garbage that we put in our spiritual system. 
We did. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. That was probably really not good for the streaming. It's that recognition that you are in relationship. Acknowledging. Let's come back to that before we're done. Let's come back to that, shall we? Let's keep moving. Now, if you're like sitting there going, now I fear that far too many of us probably didn't catch that. So I don't want to move on, but we'll come back to it. But if you caught that and you were like, ooh, yeah, I don't know if I actually recognize I am the Lord your God who brought you out. I don't know if I, I I think I may be in love with my iPhone. (laughs) I think I may be in love with my plans. I think I may be in love with my security. I think I may be in love with all kinds of other things. We call these gods at least we used to. We don't anymore. We don't have gods, right? That's all primitive, barbaric nonsense. Those Jews wandering through the desert and they had those golden statues of other gods. How silly is that? <laughs> Anybody have a gold iPhone? Nobody's laughing at that. Okay, never mind. We'll keep working that. I'll have you laughing about the iPhone before we're done. I have an iPhone, so don't. Uh, look, we don't have gods, right? Ooh. See, that thing that you, if you recognize that, that thing you recognize is where the next commandment goes, the next saying goes. This idea that there, there are these other things that compete for my allegiance. They compete for my attention. They compete for relationship with me. Now, if you follow the rabbinical conversation way back early, the ancient, before there were rabbis, there was what's known as sages. Say sages. So that before the rabbis, there were sages, and the sages kind of went through this list, and they, they recognized something that if you're, if you're really struggling, like if you're sitting here this morning, you get it, and you're like, Marty, you've convicted me. I, am I supposed to get rid of my iPhone? Am I supposed to, like, not care about my bank account? Am I supposed to not plan for my life? Like, if that's you, the sages have really helpful words. Now, do not get up and leave before I finish my sermon, because if you leave in the middle of this, this is not going to work. The, the sages went back and they said, you know what's interesting is that when God first gave this list to a bunch of wandering nomads in the desert, a bunch of rescued slaves, God did not say there are no other gods. God said you aren't to have any other gods before me. God said you weren't able to, to have, any, you can't put any other god next to. Now listen, in an ancient world, that's, that is a revolutionary idea. We take it for granted today because we've been around monotheism for a long time. In the world that's being introduced to monotheism, the idea that there's one God, that, that is a radical, revolutionary idea. Like, there's no other gods, none, when the whole world says there's multiple gods. And God says, I'm not gonna expect you to, I'm just gonna meet you where you're at and I'm gonna tell you don't, have, don't let any of those other gods share a seat with me. It, I, I view it this way. You can bring other stuff along for the ride, but typically God's somewhere in like the back seat. For, for far too many of us, he's packed away in the trunk. We're bringing him along, but God's not in the back seat. God's not even riding shotgun. God gets to drive. That's the second saying. Does that make sense? Like God gets to drive. He's not along for the ride. He's not even called shotgun. Now come on, American Christians. We, like, we, we think we're doing well if we put God in shotgun because we are driving. That's what we do. We drive. And God's with me, helping me. No, God drives. God drives. And everything else gets to find its place in the car. You can put, where, you can put it anywhere else in the car you want to, but God's driving. But then the rabbinic, now if you're sitting there going, well, Marty, I don't like that because we aren't supposed to let any other, okay, okay, well, the, the rabbinical conversation went on later in history, it kept evolving. And the rabbinical conversation said, you know what the Ten Commandments really are? Does anyone remember this from the past? We used to preach on this. One of my favorite sermons was all the way back in Pullman years ago, and we talked about how Sinai was a gigantic wedding ceremony, do you remember? And the Ten Commandments were the wedding vows. In the Jewish world, it's called the ketubah. Now, today, that means something different. But in the earlier biblical era, ketubah was this marriage covenant. It was the wedding vows. And so your Ten Commandments were your list of wedding vows. And it was one of my favorite sermons, because we got to go through there. And I I said, do you want to hear what the Ten Commandments sound like as wedding vows? And everybody was like, yeah. And, And so we went through, and he said, I am your husband. 
I am your lover. You are to have no other lovers but me, not even pictures of other lovers. Make sure that, that when we, we live together that you use our name appropriately. Don't, don't misuse our name. Don't misrepresent who we are as a couple to the world around you. Don't use, don't use my name in vain. Make sure that we have a date night, the Sabbath. Once a week, just you and me all day together. I just want one day a week. And we, we talked about the Ten Commandments as a wedding vow. And it was it's just moving. And the rabbis say, Sinai was a wedding. There was, there's a ketubah, there's a chupa. Say chupa. No, no, don't say chupa. Say chupa. Okay, the chupa, it, they had the cloud over the, all the elements are there. Sinai is without a doubt a wedding. And this, this is your wedding covenant. Now, here's what I love about this, is if you're like, okay, all the gods in their proper seat and God gets to drive. Got it, Marty. Okay, but here's the thing. If you're in a marriage, all that other stuff kind of becomes, you know when, so I got married when I was 21, and my wife was 19. We've been married for 16 years. You can do the math on that. Um, we, we've been married for 16 years. When we first got married, I know, I'm hoping so many of you relate to this, because if not, I'm gonna feel like a total idiot. When you first get married, there's like all that stuff, especially when you marry young, there's still that like post-adolescent stuff you're trying to work through, like, well, I don't know if you know this, but I had a scholarship to go play football, and I can still remember the semifinal game in 2001 where we went up against Cameo. And, and I don't know if you know this about my old girlfriends, but I always dated cheerleaders. I don't know if you know this. You may know what I'm talking about. And you're still like trying to, you're still trying to jockey around in the relationship to kind of figure out, you know what I'm, it, it, okay, there's enough chuckling. I'm, I don't feel like too much of an idiot. Do you know how weird it is if I'm 38 years old, 16 years later, still talking about my old girlfriends? Does anybody, anybody track with me? Like, it, it looks like a scene out of Napoleon Dynamite where the dude's still, like, throwing the football out by the minivan. Because <laughs> at some point, you, you grow, and that's a natural part of it. You can't get married and not be in that space, especially if you marry at like 20. You're gonna work through that, but you're going to work through that. Like there's going to be this, like, I don't talk about my old girlfriends anymore. Like I don't, that'd be weird. So, so you start, and there's all this stuff in the car, and God's in the driver's seat. But over the years, you kind of learn how to pack better, don't you? And you have some things, you've kind of learned how to fit it all in a carry-on, and it's in the trunk, and you and God are just riding together. That's the natural, that's how it works in real life marriage, and that's how it works in I am the Lord your God. We're, we're, in, we're in relationship together. We have a marriage. So, and, and I, I still have an iPhone, and I go through my seasons where I struggle. I mean, don't... Don't get me wrong. I still have a bank account and I care about the balance. I check it all the time. But all that stuff really, when I'm spiritually healthy and that's not a constant, amen? I don't know if anybody in here is like constantly spiritually healthy. But when I find a good season of spiritual health, those aren't the things that I wake up. I'm not talking to God about all my old girlfriends. I'm not talking to God about all the things that I gotta do and all my plans and my hopes and my dreams because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. One of my favorite passages comes out of Jeremiah 2, and God says, I remember when you followed me through the desert like a bride. You remember the story of the Exodus? Remember wandering in the desert for 40 years? Remember that? And God looks back on it and goes, oh, those were the days. When I first got married, we lived in a 39-foot fifth-wheel camper RV for a year and a half. <laughs> uh, first house we bought was 2,400 square feet. We never looked back. But I'll tell you something. Anybody been there? Anybody like got married and life was like crazy? But somewhere, like you look back on those days and you go, oh man, wasn't that something? God, God looks back on the 40 years in the desert and he goes, oh, I remember when we first got married. You followed me around the desert like a bride. It was glorious. Like that's how God views deserts. 
Like that's where God gave the ketubah for the first time and it was brand new. Imagine the ketubah, like imagine the 10 commandments not having the lullaby effect. Like imagine the first year that you were given the, the 10 commandments. What were those again? Say them again. And you're like, you're wandering through the desert learning about these 10 commandments and God's like, I remember those days. I was having a meeting with um, the pastor of our new church back home um, and uh, and she said, um, I feel like, I, I, I feel like I'm in the desert complaining to God about the leeks and the onions of Egypt. And I don't even know I've been delivered. I'm gonna say that again. She said, I, I feel like I'm in the desert complaining about the leeks and the onions of Egypt and I don't even know I've been delivered. Because you remember the story, that's what they do. Moses, why won't you take us back to slavery where there were melons and leeks and onions and we set around pots of meat? Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know the mind of God. I don't know if he's using, I'm not gonna get into cause, allow, give me a break. Let's not do that. I don't know if he's using this time of pandemic to try to deliver us. I don't know if he is. I don't know, some of you are like, of course he is. Okay, that's fine. I don't know the mind of God. I don't know if that's what he's up to. And I haven't gotten some prophetic word this morning. Have I made that clear? But if he is, and I think there's a good possibility, if he is, we haven't even gotten started spiritually. We haven't even gotten started. I was on Facebook this weekend. There were people in this congregation calling each other out about your political worldviews. You do it in public. I can see it. We're not even close. If God is using this pandemic to deliver us, I'm shaking. If he's using this pandemic to we don't even know we've been delivered. We're still complaining about the leeks and onions of Egypt. We're not even close. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Not that worldview, not that agenda. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. We're not even close. We're still complaining about the leeks and the onions and the melons and the pots of meat. Here's the only program that God's running in the kingdom of God. You ready? Here's the only program, the only program that's being run. Die to yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And if I could put, if I could put those passages together, for I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Die to yourself, Pick up your cross and follow me, for I am the Lord. I am driving, God says. I am not riding shotgun. I am not the sticker that you get to put on this election year to make your agenda godly. I drive the car. Die to yourself. Pick up your cross, and, and we're both doing it. We're both doing it. My progressive friends, conservative friends. You want to talk about culture shock? You want to talk about culture shock? How about you show the world something other than what they're all used to? How about we buy into something that's not just a foreign graven image? I have seen some of that, by the way, too, on Facebook, and it's glorious when I see it. Some of you inspire the daylights out of me. 
And it's really not you. It's the spirit moving through you. But man, we are capable of both, aren't we? This group, this, this room full of people, we're capable of both, right? It's not like this in Cincinnati. We're totally different. <laughs> in some ways, we're worse. I want to move towards, if you want to grab your communion supplies, see if I can do this without shaking my juice all over. I'm not ready yet. I was passionate about this message this morning. It's been a while since I preached. I don't know if I can still do it, but I was, I was passionate about talking to you guys today. And this isn't just you. Don't take it personally. I would say the same thing to any body of believers I've spoken from. We're all doing it. While you're getting this ready, here's what I want, I want us to think about. One of the most powerful, one of the most powerful things that the early church had, the one in the first century, before it got all politicized, before it stood on the handle end of the sword, before we turned this into an empire organization, before any of that stuff, when it was just a bunch of people running for their lives because Rome was out to kill them. You know why Rome was out to kill them? Because Rome was falling apart, because the second fastest growing movement in the world was a group of people that said, we ain't buying into all the class warfare. Rome was falling apart because they couldn't separate people into Republicans and Democrats. This group of people was somehow figuring out how to get together around bread and wine and go, I, I know you have convictions, I got them too, but in Jesus there is a new humanity. It was one of the most powerful things the early world had ever seen. Rome tried to crush it. Because when you can't separate people into tribes, I can't force them to do stuff and get them in all these different, I'm so glad the world has changed. Thank you. This, this was a moment of radical fellowship. You didn't get together at the Republican table and the Democrat table. It wasn't driven by election years. It, in Christ, we belong to a different kind of family. And it did not, and God was in the driver's seat. One of the things that... Uh, some families I've traveled with do. Our families try to do this at times. We haven't been great. As they get together and before they hit the road, they pray. This was like the moment for God's family every week before they hit the road. They get together and they remind themselves of what they're all about. And we will not play those games. We will not, we will be about something else because God's driving and we are along for the ride. That night, Jesus took a piece of bread and he, and he was surrounded by 12 guys, people, zealots, Herodians, Pharisees. They all came from different worldviews. That night, listen to me, if you wanna feel better, if you wanna feel better, this night, the night that they took the bread and the juice for the first time, that night, while they sat around the table, while Jesus talked about his death, that night, they argued about who was better than the other. So if you want a little bit of encouragement, know that those 12 guys on the night that Jesus is crucified were in the same place that you were. The difference is that the resurrected Christ changed them forever according to the books of Acts. That night, Jesus took a piece of bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body. Whenever you do this, remember me. Let's remember Jesus. Later that night, he took a cup and he blessed that and passed it amongst his disciples. He said, take this and drink. So this is my blood of the covenant. We're gonna start something new. Let the whole world see it. Whenever you do this, remember me. Let's remember Jesus.
Father God, my prayer is that my prayer is that we would have no other gods before you, but my real prayer is that we would simply recognize that we're in relationship with you. My prayer is that you would be in the driver's seat, but my prayer is really that we would want you along for the ride. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive us, but God, forgive me for all the times where I'd rather have the leeks and onions and melons of Egypt, the constant battle. God, teach me how to die to myself to pick up my instrument of persecution, my execution stake, the instrument of sacrifice. Teach me how to be more like that, more like you, and to love others well, to follow you. God, we praise you. We thank you. We pray all this in the name of the resurrected Christ.